always a part of my life. When I was young, my dad and I used to take apart anything that was broken. And we weren't necessarily trying to fix it. In fact, we almost always made it worse. <laughs> but the goal is just to explore what's in there. We're curious. What does it look like? And we were also looking for parts to recycle. And by recycle, I mean things like, hmm, is there a big spring we can use in a spring flying contest? Something like that. Well, that kind of curiosity and that kind of exploration, I think it's the heart of science. But curiosity, the scientist that's curious, they're becoming obsolete because most people think that oh, math is hard and science is boring. How do we put curiosity back in science? I think one way is through video games. But there's a vast divide between video games and science education. Video games are for after school. Video games are for after homework. And video games have no place in science education. And then on the flip side, well, science education is about facts. And science education is about formulas. Science education has no place for video games. But when you look at it, over 94% of 7 to 17 year olds play video games. So if they're that invested in that technology, we need to leverage that, leverage that in science education. The question I want to ask today is, what's the best way for us to build and design scientific video games? Now, what if we put it in the hands of academics? More than likely, they come up with something like this. What is 183 multiplied by 10? Pick the best answer. <laughs> now, we could do that, right? But this is just glorified PowerPoint gone bad. <laughs> and the main reason this isn't going to work is that this is attracting the audience that we already have. The person that's interested in math, the person that's interested in science, they're going to be the ones we attract here. But we already have them in the loop. That's not who we worry about. What we want to attract is a person that looks at that and goes, huh, you know, if you take any one of those three numbers, you type it into your calculator, you turn it upside down, you read it as a word, all three of them are going to spell Demi. <laughs> so that's the person that we want to engage. That's who we're after. The person that would be a brilliant, brilliant scientist, but for whatever reason, they're falling through the cracks and choosing another job. <clears throat> okay, so I know who I want to attract. I know my target audience. But the tricky part is what games to create and who should create them. Do academics belong at the table? Well, I'm an academic. I'm a seismologist, and I like to think of myself as someone who colors outside the lines. And I can prove it because I actually did that. <laughs> um, so my interest in, is uh, in earthquake source physics. How does one earthquake trigger another? Main shock, aftershock sequences. Looking at reams and reams of data and exploring it. Super, super fun. You could do it all day, every day. Which brings us to the next point, which is, hmm, Whatever I think is fun might not be the best thing for a mainstream video game, right? So how are we going to keep that in check and balance? Well, what we did in my academic lab is we decided that we're going to bring together a team of people from different disciplines. <coughs> so this is our academic team. We have Danny, our computer scientist. Danny's really the heart and brains of the whole project. Every project needs a Danny. Um, Yuri's our cartoon artist. She's going to contribute to zany and wild cartoons. I'm a seismologist in a beautiful yellow dress there. <laughs> Alan is our visualization specialist, and he's our idea man. There's no end in the number of ideas he has. Logan, who happens to be a historian, is our game tester. So he's bringing all kinds of different um, things to the table. And then we, when we need him, Matthew, our musician, will step in for the background music. So why such a motley group of people? I mean, what are you, what are you doing here? And the thing is that when we bring people from different disciplines together, they're bringing with them different wisdoms, different bodies of wisdom, bringing those to the table. So if I say, well, let's make a video game about exploring reams and reams of data trying to find a perfect wiggle, they'll say, uh-uh, ah, 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 no. <clears throat> so what we decided to put our project, our video game about, is about a seismology citizen science project. So I'll take a short commercial break to tell you what citizen science projects are, in case you don't know what they are. They're based on what I think is the teenage mentality. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, where it's like, oh, I don't want to do that. We can do it for me. Well, it turns out that mentality is brilliant. 
Because citizen science projects, what they do is they say, we have a lot of science that needs to be done. It's relatively rote over and over. So let's enlist the general public, the general population. Anyone, anywhere can participate. And there's a number of different citizen science projects out there. Whatever you're interested in, there's probably one for you. But let me tell you about our citizen science project. So anyone with an internet-connected computer can participate. And what you do is you install this small seismic sensor. It's going to measure up-down motion, north-south motion, east-west motion. And it's very small, and it's very portable. Let me show you how portable it is. <laughs> so here it is. It's handy to have boots on. Um, <laughs> it's really about the size of a credit card, a little bit bigger than your phone. It hooks into your computer through a simple USB. And what it's going to do is it gonna, it's going to measure the seismic waves are what's going on at your location whenever your computer's on. It's going to automatically collect that data in the background and automatically send it to Stanford University for data collection for nerds like me who love more data. <coughs> and seismologists actually use these small instruments after large main shocks. After the Chile magnitude 8.8 .8 earthquake in February of 2010, we deployed 100 QCN sensors in 10 days. After the New Zealand magnitude 6.3 earthquake in February 2011, 190 sensors were deployed in a week. And this is in home, schools, and offices. We didn't have to bring the computer. We didn't have to carry the 40-pound battery. We just had to carry the one small instrument. Um, so great. Now we have our team. We know our target audience. We're going to actually aim for a museum setting, so something where people play just a short amount of time. So now all we need is, oh yeah, funding. How do you get that? And then all of a sudden we got a little nervous. It's like, oh gosh, is this really a good idea? We're just a small academic group in a lab. So when in doubt, um, for just about anything in life, really, what, what do you do? You, you do a Google search. So we did a Google search. <coughs> and what we found out is that a lot of people are interested in scientific video games, science education video games. And one of them happens to be President Obama. In the fall of 2011, he hired Constance Steinkuhler as a senior policy analyst, and her job was studying the impact of video games and how play relates to learning. Well, to us, this is our green light. I mean, it's obviously a prime time to get in a game. So we wrote our grants, we got our funding, and we're off. We're going we're gonna to make a video game as academics and see what's going to happen. <coughs> so our game is called the Quake Catcher Connect game, which is a really bad name, I know. <laughs> so we're obviously not very good at names. <laughs> the reason that we have uh, Connect in there is because we're using the Connect technology. So, um, and, and uh, this is perfect for me. I call it the Xbox for old people, because when people hand me one of those controllers and they're like, push A, I'm like, where's A? I mean, pull the triggers. I don't even know where the triggers are. Okay, so for the Connect, your body is the controller. How it works is it's sending a near-infrared light from the instrument to your body and back again and using everybody's favorite formula, distance equals rate times time, they can figure out exactly where you are. So it knows my depth within one centimeter, knows my width within three millimeters, and my height within three millimeters. Knows if my arm is out or if my arm is down. <coughs> As you might guess, the game starts with an earthquake, and the player is assigned to be the scientist on the scene. So it's really important for the player to be, be in the role of the scientist. It's their job to decide where am I going to deploy my seismic sensors? You know, how many do I want to put out? Game success is measured by how close to the first aftershock your instruments are installed. And this is something called near-field recording, recording of early aftershocks. What's the best game strategy? Well, we're not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is because remember, we're trying to cultivate these curious scientists. And so what we want the player to do is to go, oh, well, I'll try this configuration. If it doesn't work, then I'll go back and try something else. So it's that iterative learning and that curiosity that we want to drive the game. Um, it starts with a tutorial, and the general idea is that the cartoon people tell you what to do, you learn it, and then you go ahead on your merry way. So here, uh, poor eye scientist is telling us that to fly forward, all you do is, is put one foot forward in front of you, and you're flying forward. <coughs> fly backwards. Fly, fly right, fly left, etc. Um, once you feel like you're flight worthy, then you're set up on your way to deploy your seismic sensors. 
two modes of play, looking mode where you can fly around the city. And some people just like flying. They don't want to deploy a seismic sensor. They're just going to fly around the city. And interaction mode where you choose which building you want to deploy your seismic sensor in. Once you choose that building, you're not just going to automatically have a sensor put there. You have to pass a mini game. OK, so what's a mini game? A mini game is just a short duration of play where you're going to learn something that relates to seismology or science or geoscience. Some of them are a little goofy, like in the middle there. Someone stole your sensor and you have to really run to catch them. <coughs> and some of them are more scientific, like given the latitude longitude of a, an earthquake, you have to move your hand on the map until you reach that point. Um, some of you might notice that, wow, there's you know, a quiz in there, Debbie. Didn't you just tell us quizzes are evil? <laughs> well, we've been testing this game on a number of different people in museum settings, science camps, uh, classes coming through. And one player said, oh, it's exhausting, all that running and bending and ducking and sweeping. I said, well, what can we do to, to do, you know, how should we fix it? And they said, well, can't you just add a boring game, a boring quiz? And we said, well, yeah, we could do that. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> so we added a boring quiz. <coughs> and but quizzes, <coughs> excuse me, quizzes have a role because the player is actually saying, you know, I learned something, I know something, I want to show it off. So quizzes are good, but in moderation, in my opinion. Once you pass it, you get this very successful sound, and a big, nice, green check mark. And then you continue on your way. So it's fly, pick a building, mini game, fly, pick a building, mini game, and that's how you progress through. Let me tell you a little bit more about one of our mini games. This is the jump mini game. And what you need to do is jump over six inches in order to test that your seismic sensor is working. Molly's demonstrating here. You have to <laughs> really catch some air like she's doing there. <laughs> and um, the, what the connect is doing is it's following what your feet are doing. So when your feet move, the shoes on the screen move. And you never know which pair of shoes from your shoe closet you're going to be assigned. And it's always fun when the 10-year-old boy gets the high-heeled shoes. <laughs> Just the first person to actually jump higher. <laughs> um, and the higher you jump, the larger the wiggle on the screen, similar to what seismologists do when they test. Of course, they're not jumping over six inches. They're usually tapping with one finger. But you know, a little artistic license is OK. Now, if you don't complete the minigame successfully, ma, fail, bad. Now, some educators see this and they're horrified. Oh, that is going to make the player feel so bad. You can't do that. But this is actually a very important part of our game. Because failure is actually built into the video game world, right? You try something, you fail, you try again. But it's not built into our education system, at least not equally. Um, has anybody had the finger tap? I certainly have. You're leaving math class, and everybody's filing out, and the teacher takes her finger, and she goes, tap, tap, tap on your finger, on your shoulder and with a big smile and annunciation, Debbie, can I see you after class? <laughs> <coughs> we all know what that means, right? You failed a test or something. Even before you start talking to her, you're like, forget it. I hate math. I'm never doing it again. <laughs> but it could just be something like, you know, you didn't understand the concept of division. Let's go over it for 20 minutes. You'll be fine. So this idea of failing and being fine is something that we really all need to work on. I think there should be a class called failure that everybody is uh, required to take. And it would be something that I think would be very popular to, to pass the failure class, where you learn how to fail and then try again. Um, to pass it, you would have to fail, right? So it um, should, you know, should be part of every curriculum. OK, at some point, an aftershock occurs, and the game will end. And just as a seismologist in the field, whenever I feel an aftershock and I'm out deploying sensors, I go, oh, what could I have done to get one more sensor out? What if I had done? So you start thinking, you know, second guessing. So that's what we want the, person, the player in the video game to be, to be the scientist and say, ooh, how could I have done this better next time? They're shown their results. And remember, they were in charge of where they're deploying their seismic sensors. So this is an aerial view. It's like you're looking out from an airplane. And then we've superimposed the aftershock location in red and the seismic stations where the player decided to deploy their seismic stations in green. And here they've done really well. So the two of those stations are really close to the aftershock. And then it has what we call a nice azimuthal distribution, mm -hmm. which just means they're not all clumped in one spot. We use a leaderboard to try to get them to play again or um, challenge their friends. <coughs> so that was our game. So I just showed you a game that was designed by academics. Is that a good idea? No, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but what it does is it says, you know, the academic, we can say, um, 
you know, pretty much when they said, Debbie, what should we make a game out of? I pummeled them with all kinds of facts. And then they asked me what I thought was fun, and I pummeled them with that. <laughs> <laughs> and as a collective, we figured out, you know, this might be a better way to go. So the next thing is we need to layer on the educators, we need to layer on the museum experts, the game, gaming experts. You know, we need to layer on these different layers to actually have something that we want to be done in public. But I want to get back to the exploration, where we started from. So back when I was a kid, if I wanted to explore, I'd call up my best friend and say, hey, you want to go get lost? And she'd go, yeah, sure, I'll meet you at the corner. So we'd get on our banana seat bikes and we'd ride around the neighborhood until we got lost. It was really important to get lost. If you didn't get lost, it was just no fun. And um, so that's really us, you know, we're just pushing our boundaries. What's out there? Even if it's just a local neighborhood structure, we're curious. What's out there? But kids today aren't doing that or I don't see any happy lost kids on bikes in my neighborhood. <laughs> so what they're doing instead is they're using video games to explore. And if you look at what's really at the essence and the heart of video games, what's really at the essence and the heart of the, of the scientists at the top of their field, the commonalities are not afraid to fail, curious, and explorers. So we want to plant that seed in the video game player that you can be the scientist. Let it be me that makes the next discovery. Let it be me that pushes the boundaries. Let it be me. Thank you.